the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Later, Jesus explained the parable to the disciples. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world, lure and the lure of wealth, choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, in another 30. The Gospel of our Lord. This is a pretty familiar parable, right? The sower and the seeds. There is a sower and he sows some seeds. <laughs> some of those seeds fall on the path, others in rocky ground and others among thorns and then Finally, some into good soil. Now, I have served as a pastor to three different congregations now, each of which had people with far more experience sowing seeds than I will probably ever have. And I think that every one of those farmers would agree that this sower would not make a very good farmer because seeds are seeds. Good seeds must be treated with care. If anyone wants a harvest come fall, if any farmer wants a good harvest, then not one of them is going to go about scattering seeds all willy-nilly, all over pathways and thorn-infested ground. And even though we can recognize that this parable was spoken a couple thousand years ago when seeds would have been sown by hand, I think it's still true. Because even without the precision of modern technology, anyone sowing seeds, I have to believe, would be more careful than this sower. So... While the recklessness of the sower is pretty obvious, it's always a little less obvious to me. I have to suspect it's because really I'm a city slicker. The yields mentioned in this parable are just as off kilter as the sower's recklessness. Jesus speaks of yields of a hundredfold and sixtyfold and thirtyfold. Research tells me that 
normal expectation would be or would have been four to five fold. So it seems like in more than one spot, this parable is out of balance. Now, in Jesus' explanation of the parable, in that second portion of the reading, it's interesting because Jesus only discusses the soil. Jesus speaks nothing of the sower. I have to wonder if this is because the sower is God, whose actions we cannot affect or alter. No matter how reckless we might think it is, God will scatter seeds of grace and love abundantly, no matter how or where they will land. We might think it's wasteful to be gracious to the ones who seem less deserving, but God refuses to operate under this kind of system. No, in God's eyes, all are worthy. All are beloved. And so the love is spread everywhere, no matter what. And when God's good seed finds good soil, the reward is far beyond what we could ever dream or imagine. God's seeds in rich soil reaps a yield that can change the world. So now, since the actions of the sower are apparently not up for either explanation or debate, we find ourselves looking to Jesus' explanation of the different places where the seeds land. Mostly, it has been my thinking up to this point that different kinds of people represent different kinds of ground. Some people, the ones with hard hearts, are the pathway. God's grace hardly even breaches their surface, so run down by the weight they carry within them. And likewise, some are rocky soil. Right? You know them, the people who get all excited about things at the first, but then don't ever seem to have any staying power, right? And so on. But then this week, I read something where someone suggested that we might each carry within us all four kinds of ground. Hmm. Rick Morley, he says, I have good soil potential within me, and it's only a stone's throw from some seriously rocky ground. Not far, not far from the thorns and weeds either. And depending on the day or the moment or the circumstance, I end up presenting one or the other. That feels pretty relatable to me. I guess when you think about it, the reason why we sing, Lord, let my heart be good soil, back when we could sing together. Lord, let my heart be good soil is because we realize that there are times when our hearts do not behave like good soil. Think of all the times when I've jumped into something because it seemed so important, but then after a short time, you know, it kind of fizzled out for me. Rocky soil in my heart. And then I think about the stories that I read here of people suffering that I just look past. Stories that just don't affect me personally enough or at all, really. So I just don't give them any of my time or concern. Pathways and birds. So now when I think about it, 
it's absolutely true that I have all four of these kinds of ground within me and within my heart. And none of them are that far away from each other. Depending on the day or the story or the need, one of them shows up to catch seeds. So I think I and we need to keep singing, Lord, let my heart be good soil. As Rick Morley concludes, Jesus is asking us here, I love this, to bring our best dirt so that his way can take root deep within us. This isn't something that happens by chance or because we're fortunate to have good genes. It's something we put effort into. Good dirt, it turns out, takes work. So there are a lot of things that we can do to bring our best dirt. I'm thinking spending time in prayer and God's word, scripture, but also of spending time in God's creation, right? Just drinking in the splendor of it all. And we all know that doing good things for other people is always a good way to nurture our own hearts. It's good, I think, and right to do the things, to do the work that will make our soil more fertile. Here's the thing. Every single person who has ever tried to grow a garden, and surely all of those farmers that I know will tell you that you cannot fertilize soil once and forget about it. Nor do you pull weeds once a season and then never see them again. Heavens, no. And it isn't the case that you can dig up the rocks out of your soil with the promise of never finding another. Someday, I will figure out where they come from. I don't know. But the work, tending soil, takes patience and perseverance and even a little stubbornness. It's ongoing work. If we intend to bring our best dirt today and next week and next year, then we need to be prepared to do the work. The good news is, oh, the good news. <laughs> the good news is that there is not a garden or a heart or a hill of dirt anywhere that exists outside of the presence of God. God is everywhere and relentless in God's reckless sowing of seeds of grace and love. And when those great moments happen and our best dirt shows up to meet what God is sowing, the yield, it will change the world. May it be so. Again, and again, and forevermore.